Hello, my name is Lone Tran, and I want to welcome you to the Professional Development Webinar Series brought to you by GLSEN, the Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network. With more than 20 years of experience, we are the leading national education organization focused on ensuring safe schools for all students. Here at GLSEN, we envision a world in which every child learns to respect and accept all people, regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, or gender expression. We seek to develop school climates where difference is valued for the positive contributions it makes to a more diverse and vibrant community. Today's topic is supporting transgender and gender nonconforming students like myself. Who are we? What are our experiences in schools? How can you best support us? And what resources are available for you and your colleagues to best meet our needs? Over the next 30 minutes, we'll be addressing those questions and more. We hope to leave you with real-world best practices and tools to help you support your transgender and gender nonconforming students. Thanks, Lone. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. As Lone mentioned, the information covered in this webinar comes from more than 20 years of GLSEN's programmatic efforts with students and educators across the country and more than a decade of research specifically on the experiences of LGBT students in schools. You'll find the relevant data, model policies, and tools throughout the webinar and can download them for free at glisten.org. Let's get started by taking a look at gender, the socially constructed system of characteristics and expectations associated with masculinity and femininity. Typically, gender is thought of as a distinct binary with feminine or women on one side and masculine or men on the other. It all starts with those first questions we ask when we find out a friend or family member is going to have a baby. Is it a boy or a girl? A baby's born and immediately assigned a gender of female or male based on an interpretation of their body, mostly the visible markers of their reproductive anatomy, and from there, people even already know what gifts to buy them. Pink things for baby girls and blue things for baby boys. We know the set of expectations that correspond to each of those genders too. Girls and later women are expected to be caretakers, have long hair, and wear skirts, to be our mothers and teachers and nurses. Boys and later men are expected to take charge, to have short hair and wear pants, to be our soldiers, our firefighters, our business leaders. It seems so simple. Two boxes, pick one. But it's not. The binary just isn't accurate. First of all, people are complex. No one can fit into those narrow expectations all the time. Sometimes girls want to wear blue and play with trucks, and sometimes boys want to wear pink and play with dolls. What it means to be female or male is felt and interpreted differently by all of us. And some of us are assigned a gender at birth that ends up just not fitting with how we really feel about ourselves later on. Regardless of that assignment as babies, some of us identify as male, some as female, some as both, some as neither, some as transgender, some as genderqueer, or any of the myriad identities that feel right at a particular time. Add to all of that our other identities, and whoa, it's definitely not simple. So let's connect the concept of gender back to our main topic, which is supporting transgender and gender nonconforming students. What do we even mean by transgender and gender nonconforming? To start, we'll go over a few relevant definitions, but remember, language is constantly evolving and may vary for each individual. One way to think of it is to picture a map. A definition might be like a zip code rather than an actual address. You can use the following terms and definitions to get a sense of the neighborhood or what it generally means to be transgender or gender nonconforming. The specifics, the address, if you will, may be different for everyone. For example, watch this quick interview with Willow, a high school student in North Carolina. Notice the unique complexity, that specific address of Willow's gender identity and expression. My name is Willow. I go to West Rowan High School in Salisbury, North Carolina. I'm a senior graduating this year. I'm in Latin club. Um, I do a lot of really geeky stuff with computers, um, music. I play the cello as well as a couple other instruments. But uh, all around, I'm a pretty geeky, fun kind of guy or girl. <laughs> and basically, when I say that I'm gender nonconforming or gender queer, I say um, I don't really identify as um, fully male or fully female, I just sort of 
I'm androgynous. I'm not really either gender, and I'm just sort of me. I'd like to uh, fully transition sometime in the future, but just right now in my current life, I'm, it's not really possible. So I'm uh, trying to be content with gender nonconforming because our grandma's struggling with that as it is. Generally, my family's trying to be supportive, although they don't really understand very well, and I'm trying to teach them. At school, I don't really identify as gender nonconforming. I'm just the gay kid, as everyone calls me, much to my displeasure. Um, I, I don't think it would, in a rural setting with a lot of, I'm already dealing with enough harassment in the school. Um, I don't want to make it any worse on myself, which I wish it wasn't like that, but it is. In my uh, freshman year, that was a really bad year for me. Um, I was battling a couple of other issues, and uh, I actually didn't go to school for about a week straight because I had some very notable threats made against me, and I was afraid. So I faked being sick, and I stayed home, and it really hit my grades really bad. What happened was I had been shoved into a locker. Um, people had been calling me names. Were really, it was escalating fast, and I had to go to the guidance counselor or the principal or whoever, and they sent me to the guidance counselor. At least I wound up at the guidance counselor somehow, and I said, hey, listen, this, this, and this is happening, and this is who's doing it. And they said, well, first they said, well, since I can't see it, I can't stop it. Or since it wasn't there, I can't do it. And then he told me, well, maybe you're bringing it on yourself because you're not acting masculine enough and you're not being as normal as everyone else. Felt me like I was being pushed aside. And I didn't like that. It really hurt my feelings and it made me feel a little less than the other students. Welcome back. Willow uses several terms to describe gender identity and expression and how that might change over time. For the purposes of this webinar, we're going to use these. Transgender, defined as a person whose gender identity or expression are not aligned with the gender that they were assigned at birth. Transgender is often used as an umbrella term encompassing a large number of identities related to gender nonconformity. Gender nonconforming can be a descriptive term or an identity of a person who has a gender identity or expression that doesn't conform to the gender they were assigned at birth. People who identify as gender nonconforming may or may not also identify as transgender. And we have cisgender, a person whose gender identity and expression are aligned with the gender they were assigned at birth. Those are the definitions we'll be working with throughout this webinar. But identity is more complex than that. As we saw with Willow, for any number of reasons, your students may not express themselves in ways that seem aligned with their gender identity. You can never know someone's gender identity simply by looking at them. It's also important to note that for each of us, our gender identity or how we identify in terms of our gender is distinct from our sexual orientation or who we're attracted to emotionally and physically. Everyone has both a gender identity and a sexual orientation, along with identities based on race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, immigration status, religion, language, ability, and others that intersect and impact our experiences as we move through the world. Now, let's take a look at some of the data around the experiences of transgender and gender nonconforming students in schools across the country. At GLSEN, we love data. By ensuring that our work is based on research, we can develop effective strategies that improve the school experiences of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or LGBT students. You can access all of our research findings at glisten.org for free. Check them out after this webinar. And if you're on Twitter, you should definitely follow GLSEN Research. This first set of data comes from GLSEN's 2011 National School Climate Survey. For more than a decade, the biennial survey has documented the unique challenges of LGBT students and identified interventions that can improve school climate. The survey explores the prevalence of anti-LGBT language and victimization, the effect that these experiences have on LGBT students' achievement and well-being, and how LGBT-related school supports can help lessen some of the negative effects of a hostile school climate and promote positive educational experiences. The survey also examines demographic and community-level differences in LGBT students' experiences. 
Let's take a closer look at what the latest survey found for transgender and gender nonconforming LGBT students. The 2011 survey explored the differences in LGBT students' experiences of safety and victimization and looked at it by gender identity. It's broken down in this chart by female, male, transgender, and other gender identities, which can include genderqueer and other things like that. As you can see, across all gender groups, many LGBT students reported feeling unsafe at school because of their sexual orientation and gender expression. Transgender students, however, were generally more likely than all other students to have felt unsafe at school because of their gender expression. Students who have a gender identity other than male, female, or transgender, so those other gender identities, were also more likely to have felt unsafe. So why do our transgender and gender nonconforming students feel so unsafe at school? Here we see LGBT students' experiences of harassment and assault based on gender expression, again, broken down by gender identity. The percentages you see reflect those students who report experiencing higher levels of harassment or assault. That's either sometimes, often, or frequently when we ask them. Look at the greater levels of verbal harassment, being called names and threatened, physical harassment, being pushed or shoved, and physical assault, being punched, kicked, or injured with a weapon that's reported by transgender students and those who identify as some other gender. In the 2011 survey, GLSEN also asked students about their own gender expression to examine whether there were differences in school experiences based on how gender conforming or non-conforming they are. LGBT students who reported being gender non-conforming often experience a more hostile school climate than their peers. In this webinar, we've mostly talked about school experiences related to gender expression. Trans and gender nonconforming students are also more likely to report victimization based on sexual orientation. But it's important for us to remember that LGBT students are not a monolithic group, and they also experience victimization based on other identities, such as race or ethnicity and religion. Let's take a look at GLSEN's research report, Harsh Realities, based on the 2007 National School Climate Survey data, which provides a deeper analysis of the experiences of trans and gender nonconforming students. Similar to the figure we just looked at from the 2011 survey, here we see that transgender students had the highest levels of victimization when compared to cisgender, lesbian, gay, and bisexual students. The differences between transgender students and other students in the survey were most pronounced for victimization based on sexual orientation and gender expression, but were also higher for victimization based on race or ethnicity, disability, and religion. Given that transgender students are more likely to feel unsafe in school and to experience more frequent harassment and assault, it's not surprising that transgender students were also more likely to have worse educational outcomes, lower college aspirations, and miss more school due to safety concerns than non-transgender students. On a more positive note, although transgender students were not more likely to report having a gay-straight alliance in their school, they did attend GSA meetings more often than their non-transgender, lesbian, gay, and bisexual peers. As you can see here, over two-thirds of transgender students reported attending GSA meetings frequently or often, compared to about half of their non-transgender peers. Complementing our research at GLSEN, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force and the National Center for Transgender Equality developed their Injustice at Every Turn report based on the responses of over 6,000 transgender and gender nonconforming adults that looks at the depth and breadth of injustice in their lives. As we would expect, the findings are similar to those from GLSEN's National School Climate Survey. Looking back on their school experiences, 78% reported being harassed. 35% physically assaulted, 12% sexually assaulted, and 6% expelled. As a result, almost one-sixth left school altogether.
So we've seen the research. We know that trans and gender nonconforming students feel less safe at school than their cisgender peers, that they miss more school and experience more victimization based on all of their identities. So how do we fix any of this? How do we lessen the victimization? And how do we ensure that transgender and gender nonconforming students feel supported and affirmed as they come in contact with all levels of the school community? And how do we recognize and affirm their multiple identities? At GLSEN, we know that for LGBT students in general, including trans and gender nonconforming students, there are four interventions that positively impact the experiences in school. Gay Straight Alliances and similar student-led clubs where students have a safe place to find friends and allies and build leadership skills. LGBT inclusive curriculum where students are validated by seeing themselves reflected in classroom lessons and assignments. Comprehensive and enumerated policies ensuring that all students have safe and affirming learning environments. And finally, supportive educators like you who listen, affirm, protect, and empower students to live to their potential. You can find more information about implementing the four interventions in GLSEN Safe Space Kit, also available for download for free at glsen.org. Now let's take some time to explore practices specific to creating supportive school environments for trans and gender nonconforming students. What follows are suggestions to think about, topics to explore, and questions to ask. We'll discuss them in two groups. One, gender segregated spaces, and two, records and rules. There's no one-size-fits-all solution to making your school safe and affirming for all students, so you'll have to work with your trans and gender nonconforming students to find the right support strategies to meet their individual needs. Let's go to Bryce for the details. Hey everyone, my name is Bryce, and I work with Glisten in the Washington, D.C. office, and I'm here to talk to you about students like me who are transgender and gender nonconforming. In addition to the bullying and harassment that we discussed earlier, transgender and gender nonconforming students are also significantly challenged by institutional policies, practices, and spaces at school that are defined by gender. These include spaces and activities that segregate students by gender, such as bathrooms, locker rooms, sports teams, line formations for early grade levels, dress codes, sleeping quarters for boarding schools and overnight trips, seating at graduation ceremonies, prom awards, and sometimes even academic subjects. Here's a clip from Unheard Voices, an LGBT history project from GLSEN, the Anti-Defamation League, and Story Corps. Jameson Green, a transgender man, talks about his first school memories. We will tell you where you can listen to the rest of Green's story and download related classroom materials and resources a little bit later. I think I really consciously felt different my first day of kindergarten. I always hated wearing dresses, but my parents dressed me up and we walked in and the kindergarten teacher welcomed me and she said, the little girls are over here. But as soon as I saw the guys with the trucks, I went right over there in my little dress and started playing with these two kids. Hopefully you enjoyed hearing a little bit of Jameson's story and decide to learn more about it later. For the well-being and safety of transgender and gender nonconforming students like Jameson and myself, your school should reduce or eliminate the practice of unnecessarily segregating students by gender wherever possible. Requiring a transgender or gender nonconforming student to pick a line, location, or activity according to their gender identity may be incredibly stressful and even unsafe and oftentimes lead to victimization. In the few situations where you must segregate students by gender, everyone should be included in the group that corresponds to their gender identity. For instance, male-identified students, transgender or not, go into the male group. And students who do not identify as male or female should be consulted with to develop an acceptable solution. So let's look at some situations that schools often find most challenging, starting with restrooms and locker rooms, places that many trans and gender nonconforming students find unsafe. Everyone needs to use the bathroom from time to time. Imagine what it would be like to spend your entire day at school without safe access to a restroom. Unfortunately, with transgender and gender nonconforming students like myself, we oftentimes face stigma, bullying, violence, and even punishment for using the facilities. All students should have access to and be safe in all restrooms on campus that correspond to their gender identity. 
If someone has a particular need or desire for increased privacy, regardless of the reason, they should be provided access to a single cell restroom. But you should never require trans or gender nonconforming students to use facilities separate from the rest of the student body. And it's similar for locker rooms, you know? As a transgender person who is also an athlete, I've experienced the importance of being comfortable in the locker room firsthand. In most cases, transgender and gender nonconforming students should have access to the locker room that corresponds to their gender identity, just like all other students. However, you might need to work with individuals with individual transgender and gender nonconforming students on a case-by-case -case basis to come up with arrangements that they feel comfortable with. Whatever solution you come to agree on should aim to work to maximize their social integration and opportunities to participate in PE and athletics to ensure their safety and comfort and minimize stigma. Figuring out the locker room issue really helps ensure that transgender students are able to participate in physical education classes, any real sports, and in its classic athletics in a manner consistent with their gender identity, and to benefit from the opportunities for self-esteem building, social interaction, and fitness that go along with them. For students who don't identify as either male or female, discuss their options and work together to come up with arrangements that they feel comfortable with. Thanks, Bryce. While gender segregated spaces can be particularly harmful to trans and gender nonconforming students, as we've been discussing, they can also have negative impacts on the entire student body. That compulsive segregation helps teach and enforce incredibly limiting ideas of what is appropriate in terms of gender identity and expression for everyone. Now what about all those administrative details? The records and rules that keep your school functioning in an organized way. Well, it's pretty easy. Follow the required policies in your state or district, work to affirm each student's gender identity, and make sure to prioritize their privacy. Here are some examples. Let's start with names and pronouns and what's appropriate to use when working with transgender and gender nonconforming students. Every student has the right to be addressed by their preferred name and pronoun. You should refer to trans and gender nonconforming students as they wish, similar to students with nicknames. Not doing so can invalidate their identity and be extremely painful. If you're not sure what they prefer, just ask. Better yet, invite all your students to share their preferred gender pronouns, commonly referred to as PGPs. They may prefer traditional pronouns such as she, her, hers, or he, him, his. Gender neutral pronouns such as they, them, theirs, or z, here, here's, or no pronouns at all. Their preferences may change over time, and that's okay too. But what about students' official records? Well, your school should continue to maintain a permanent pupil record that includes a student's legal name and legal gender. In situations where you're required by law to use a student's legal name and gender, such as during standardized testing or on transcripts, you should do so. But work to maintain the student's privacy. In all other situations, where you aren't legally required to use a student's legal name and gender, use the name and gender preferred by the student. Yearbooks and school IDs are a good example of this, since they're not legal documents and therefore should use their preferred name. Unfortunately, many trans and gender nonconforming students have experienced their legal name and gender being used unnecessarily and against their will in those non-legal documents and even in class. This can out a student and may expose them to bullying and harassment. And what about parents? How do you balance parental communication and student confidentiality? As a general rule, when it comes to parents or guardians, use a student's legal name and pronoun to ensure their privacy and safety unless the student, parent, or guardian is specified otherwise. All students in school have a right to privacy and this includes the right to keep their gender private. You should not disclose information that may reveal a student's transgender status to anyone, including their parents or other school staff, unless you're legally required to do so or the student says it's okay. Students have the right to discuss and express their gender identity openly at school and still decide when, with whom, and how much to share private information. Now what about dress codes? First of all, clothing, hair, and accessories are vital parts of every student's self-expression and are often related to their gender. 
all students, including trans and gender nonconforming students, should have the right to dress in accordance with their gender identity within the constraints of your school or district dress codes. For example, if there's a length requirement for skirts, it should apply equally to all students, regardless of their gender identity. And you shouldn't enforce the dress code more strictly against trans or gender nonconforming students than any other students. While there are many components to meeting the needs of transgender and gender nonconforming students, as is evident in the items we just discussed, it seems to all boil down to this. Respect their gender identity and expression. Ensure that they're allowed to participate fully in school in ways that are consistent with their identity and prioritize their privacy. It's that simple. All of the information we've covered today and more can be found on our website, glisten.org, and we'll provide you with a resource list at the end of the webinar. Let's take a moment to highlight the Glisten resources that may be of most use to you as you work to support your transgender and gender nonconforming students. We'll use those four interventions as a guide, GSAs, inclusive curriculum, comprehensive policies, and supportive staff like you. Remember earlier when we showed you that a large number of transgender students who have GSAs at their school attend the meetings? Keep that trend going. Get involved with your GSA and share GLSEN's Jumpstart Guide, including Part 7, which is Making Your Student Club Trans Inclusive. The guide also helps students look at multiple forms of bias and oppression. You should also visit GLSEN's page for Transgender Day of Remembrance which contains an assortment of resources on transgender heroes, being an ally to trans students, and more. Inclusive curriculum benefits trans and gender nonconforming students when they can see themselves reflected in the textbooks, readings, and assignments. It also benefits all students when they're exposed to a more accurate and comprehensive view of history and the world around them. Check out the rest of Jameson Green's story and the accompanying free and downloadable teacher support materials and student handouts at glisten.org. And remember that trans and gender nonconforming students have multiple salient identities, not just those related to their gender. Make sure that your policies are up to date and include protections for all students, regardless of gender identity and gender expression. As a guide, use GLSEN and the National Center for Transgender Equality's Model District Policy on Transgender and Gender Nonconforming Students. It outlines the best practices and guidelines for schools to take in support of transgender and gender nonconforming student inclusion and safety. In fact, we've referenced many of the components of the model policy in this very webinar. And share Know Your Rights with your trans and gender nonconforming students. Created by GLSEN and the ACLU, it's a simple guide to inform students and their family and friends about their rights at school. Oh, hey everyone, it's me again, Bryce. So, what's the most important of the four interventions you ask? Well, the answer to that is simple. It's you, of course. Students like us need you to be an ally, so I'll leave you with this, a suggestion. No, 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 wait a minute. More like a challenge after all you've learned today. It's a small but meaningful step towards supporting your transgender and gender nonconforming students. And trust me, it really does mean a lot to us and goes a long way. So, I challenge you to ask for preferred gender pronouns or PGPs. So you should do this when you're, when you're doing introductions at the beginning, beginning of future classes and student club meetings. I know for me and other transgender students, it makes us feel safer, more respected, and gears us up to be more ready to learn. Plus, the rest of your students will learn a little bit more about gender and the empowerment that comes with self-defining. Follow these four steps. One, invite students to share their preferred gender pronouns with the group. Let them know that it is fine to pass on sharing their PGPs for any reason. Two, explain why preferred gender pronouns are important and provide examples of all different kinds of pronouns. For example, he, him, and his, she, her, and hers. Also, gender neutral pronouns which can be forgotten sometimes but shouldn't be, like they, them, like they, them, and their, or z, here, and here's. Remember, 
but some people use a set or sets of pronouns other than or in addition to what was assigned to them at birth. And then some people don't even use pronouns at all and just be preferred to be called their name. Step three. You want to listen to your you want to listen to your students and their preferred gender pronouns. And then step four, you want to ask your students to agree to do their best to refer to everyone by their preferred gender pronoun. That way, the classroom climate can be safe and affirming for everyone. You've watched this webinar because you care about your students, all of them. Each and every day that you step into your classroom or office or library, you have the opportunity to support your trans and gender nonconforming students. You already had the desire, and now you have a few more ideas and tools to help you create a school environment where all students can thrive. And hey, that's what we want too. So from here on out, we're partners. Use and share our resources. Keep learning and exploring your own ideas about gender. Connect with your local GLSEN chapter, and let us know when you need help. We're in this together. We want to wrap up this webinar on supporting transgender and gender nonconforming students with a short video showing what happens when a school community rallies around one student. Meet Chase. My name is Chase Stein. I go to Wiley E. Groves High School in Beverly Hills, Michigan, and I am in 11th grade. I love school. I'm in five AP or Honors classes right now, which is really exciting. I play travel ice hockey uh, with the women's ice hockey team, and I also work with Glisten Southeast Michigan doing t a ton of volunteering stuff. I identify as a lesbian and also as gender nonconforming. Well, my personal definition of gender nonconforming is that there's a traditional definition of a binary gender system of male and female, but I think that most people fall somewhere in between and it's not just like black and white. So I identify as maybe somewhere in between. I came out in my eighth grade year as a gay person, not as gender nonconforming. My gender appearance then was more in line with gender expectations. When I came out in eighth grade, I told a couple people and it really quickly spread around the school. And because of bullying, I felt pressured to tell my parents. I think the main thing for me was that I was socially excluded while I was at school, outside of school. And I really only felt like I had a few friends and people that I could talk to. I found support in teachers. Um, there were some LGBTQ identified teachers at my school, so I found support very quickly with them. And I also found support from a lot of teachers who were willing to learn about LGBT issues because I was one of the first students at my middle school that had ever come out as non-heterosexual. So I really found a lot of support from teachers who were willing to be allies. Additionally, I found support from GLSEN when I planned a day of silence event during my eighth grade year. I talked to the principal at my middle school and he was okay with me doing a day of silence event so I got a lot of my 8th grade class, around probably 70% of my 8th grade class, to be silent for a day and wear red duct tape over their mouth to symbolize that they were supportive of LGBT issues. And this was about like 8 months after I had come out so people were really coming to terms with it and weren't as, it wasn't as problematic anymore. So it really was great because it was like a capstone of support at the end of my 8th grade year. So there are a lot of teachers at my high school that have safe space stickers up on their door. And this is really important because it allows students to see that these classrooms are a safe space. And I think that that's definitely evident in the way that students and staff act. People actually treat each other with respect. People don't use language that's offensive to LGBT people when they're in the safe space rooms. And when a student does use anti-LGBT language, they are reprimanded. So before I came out, I was in essentially every privileged group. I was wealthy, I was white, I was from a Christian family background, I was of European descent. I went from a place of being in every power group to being in two particularly oppressed social groups. I was, uh, had a non-gender conforming appearance and I was identifying as gay. Once I came out, I lost that privilege. I lost the uh, right of being in every power group and I shifted to a place where I saw oppression. I think for someone who's struggling with their own identity, it can be a relief to see other LGBTQ identified teens uh, striving towards success. Whether that's seeing me in the GSA or seeing me doing all these events like the Safe Schools Advocacy Summit or the GLSEN Media Ambassador Summit, they see that there's hope for other LGBTQ students, even if they don't have the strength to come up themselves right now. Everyone has the power to come out at a different time, and there's no one universally right time, but being able to see that there are other LGBTQ teens and they're not always depressed, they're not uh, always suffering, and they're, sometimes they're 
empowering themselves and they're doing good things in their community. I think that's really necessary for those teens.